Good evening, brethren and friends. We are so happy to see you here on this Lord's Day evening. We're grateful for the opportunity to come together to study the Word of God. Once again, we are happy uh, that you are here. We have a good number with us. Of course, many of our number are perhaps still traveling home from uh, East Tennessee and been at CYC over the weekend, but we are so happy that uh, you are here and allowing this opportunity for us to fellowship together and look to the Word of God together. Appreciate all who have led us in worship up to this point, and uh, we're ready to begin our study in the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. If you want to go ahead and open your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 1, most of our study, nearly all of it, will come from the book of Nehemiah. From time to time, I might reference another scripture, but we'll pretty much be studying just in the, uh, the book of Nehemiah. I mentioned last month on the fourth Sunday that I wanted to use the fourth Sunday p.m. services to talk about church leadership and uh, talk about um, uh, leadership within the church. And last month, we looked at uh, the shepherds uh, of the flock, the shepherds to shepherd congregations. Today I want to look at uh, qualities of a godly leader using the man Nehemiah. We have many leaders in the Bible, but I want to notice some of the qualities of this great leader. Of course, uh, he was uh, before Christianity, so we're not saying he was an elder in the church or anything like that, but a great leader and, and one who, who likely would have been able to serve as one had he met the qualifications as you see in first timothy chapter three and titus chapter one so i want to notice with you a handful of areas today that uh help this man that stands out about this man that would cause us to say he was a a great leader uh for the people notice first of all i do want to begin in chapter one but before we get into the lesson look to chapter two in verse 18. I want to notice a couple of things. Jeff read for us the first three verses of chapter 1. Then he read for us chapter 6 and verse 15. As you remember, the first uh, three verses, Nehemiah gets this report about Jerusalem and the people there. And then in chapter 6 and verse 15, the walls are rebuilt in only 52 days, so less than, than uh, two months. This work is completed. So uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, works out there about this. Actually, Neil Pollard uh, he, he had a book some years ago. I never read it. I need to read it. But Neil Pollard wrote a book uh, about this, uh, the work of Nehemiah in these 52 days. And knowing Brother Pollard, I'd highly recommend it. Um, and uh, and uh, perhaps I'll read it and tell you more about it sometime. But notice this. Notice this. Chapter 2 and verse 18. Let us rise up and build. Let us rise up and build. This is the leadership of Nehemiah. Chapter 2 and verse 18, let us rise up and build. Then, if you get to chapter 4 and verse 6, chapter 4 and verse 6, for the people had a mind to work. Brethren and friends, when you can take leadership that motivates people and says, let us rise up and build. let's do something, let us do the work, and then you can take people who have a mind to work, and you can combine them, there's no stopping you. There's no stopping you. Of course, as long as you're doing it according to God's will. We don't want to go against God's will, but when you have this mindset from leadership as well as the people who are ready to work, oh, there's, there's, there's just, it would be amazing to see all that could be done and all the ways that the Lord can bless. So let's notice a little bit about this great man. In the first verses, verses 2 and 3 at least, we see he was a leader who was concerned about his brethren. He was concerned about the welfare of his brethren. In uh, verse 2, then Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with me from Judah, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity and concerned in Jerusalem. Remember, this is, this is after the Babylonian captivity. The book of Nehemiah, if this book, the Bible, the Old Testament were placed in chronological order, this book would be one of the last two books. It would probably be Nehemiah and Malachi, or maybe Malachi and Nehemiah. But those two books, that, that, you're getting to the end of the, the, the time period of the writing of the Old Testament. So I know it's more in the middle you know, of, of the Old Testament, but chronologically speaking, you're at the end of the writings of the Old Testament. So this book is 
following the captivity of Babylon. So Babylon had already come in, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. Captivity is over. The people are going back now. And uh, that's where Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther would fall into place. But you see, he's concerned about something. I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. They said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Here's a man who had compassion. Here is a man who was concerned about his brethren, the welfare for his brethren, as well as the city, the city of Jerusalem, and, and, and the wall around it. He was concerned about all of this. That's one thing that made him a great leader. Leaders who are great leaders, and really I would go a step further say godly leaders because there are a lot of great leaders who are not godly but all godly leaders I would say are great leaders and here's a man who is a godly leader because he was he was concerned about his homeland he was concerned about his home people he was concerned about their welfare he wanted to know about them he wanted to know about their state of mind their emotional state he wanted to know how they were doing but also he hears this report about Jerusalem and, and again imagine if this were your hometown imagine if some foreign nation came in, overrun us, took us captive, destroyed the area. Some years later, 70 years later, that's how long Babylonian captivity was. And now you, things are maybe trying to get back to normal, but then you hear reports. You've not been back home yet, but you hear reports. It's, it's all in ruins. It's nothing like what you're going to remember when you get there. That would be difficult. But that is the days of Nehemiah and Ezra and Esther. That's, that's their days. That's what they were dealing with. That's their trouble that they had to deal with during that time. So we see this is a great leader because he was concerned about other people. Godly leaders care about other people. Godly leaders are concerned. In particular, when we talk about the eldership in the Lord's church today, we discussed 1 Peter chapter 5 and the first four verses in detail last month. They care, they care about their people. They're concerned about their people. They're concerned about those within the congregation. We see, if you continue to read into verse 4, that this man had a heart of compassion. As you see in uh, verses 2 and 3, he gets this report. What happens in verse 4? So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Here was a man who, who had this great compassion for his people but but also for jerusalem uh for for, for his home area um, for what happened to it he was a compassionate man how many times does the bible talk about jesus being compassionate i, I don't know that answer if i if i knew it off the top of my head i would tell you but that would be a, a question to consider would it not over and over and over. Matthew chapter 9, I think of that, uh, the last few verses where Jesus had compassion for his people. And, and oftentimes we see the Bible describing Jesus as looking at them with compassion, such as the feeding of the uh, 5,000 and about Matthew chapter 14. So you see that about Jesus over and over and over, a man who had compassion, compassion for his people. Nehemiah was a great leader because he had a heart of compassion. And that's what we need to develop in our leaders. That's what we need to, to train our leaders as now, as well as our future leaders, with our children and our grandchildren and our Bible classes and at home and every opportunity that we have. We need to teach them to be people of compassion. We've been praying for weeks. Shannon just led a beautiful prayer for our brethren in Ukraine. Imagine if this world were full of compassionate political leaders. We wouldn't have to pray prayers like that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have to worry about that. Compassionate, concerned about other people and their welfare and, 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 and wanting what is best for them. We see that this man had a heart of compassion. If you continue in chapter 1, you look to verses 4 through 6, he believed in the power of prayer. And really it's verses 4 through 11. If, 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 you wanna, if you're taking notes, it's actually verses 4 through 11. But I want to break the prayer up a little. I want to know the specific areas of his prayer. But this man, he believed in the power of prayer. What does he do in verse 4? I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. In verse 5, I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Last Sunday morning, the sermon was on prayer. This would be a, an excellent prayer to study and study often. If you want to know what a godly prayer sounds like, verses 4 through 11. 
This man knew how to pray. And he believed in the power of prayer. Once again in verse 5, Lord God of heaven, O oh great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants. Verses 4, 5, and the first part of verse 6. He was a leader who believed in prayer. He believed in the power of prayer. And he was a prayerful leader. That's what we need. Uh, and that we, we need all people in the Lord's church, of course, to be prayerful people. But especially, especially among our leaders. We need them to be people who pray and pray often. Pray to God. Pray for the people. Pray for the congregation. Pray for the circumstances. Pray for the works of the congregation. That is what we need. But if you continue on in verse 6, you see that he was a leader who was realistic. He recognized the reality of life. Go back to chapter 1 in verse 6. In the latter part, when he's praying for the children of Israel, your servants. But notice what he does. And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Here was a man in verses 6 and 7 who looked at it with realistic eyes. He didn't, he didn't cover it up. He didn't say, oh, there's no problems. There's nothing bad. There's nothing wrong. He was willing to take an, a realist, realistic approach. He was willing to say, we've, we've done wrong. And again, this is after captivity. But as again, if you read some in these books, like Ezra chapters 9 and 10, as well as in the book of Malachi, and Haggai and Zechariah, just the same. Even after captivity, they let their sinful ways come back in. There was this sinfulness about them. Here was a leader that did not turn a blind eye to sin. Here's a leader who did not say, well, we have no problems. Everything is great. Everything is grand. You know, he was willing to say, no, we've we got some problems. And if we're going to go back and rebuild this wall, if, if we're going to tell the people, let's rise up and build, if we're going to motivate the people who, who has a mind to work, if we're going to get this job, I wonder if Nehemiah knew at the beginning, when they went back on day one to begin this work, I wonder if he ever imagined they would complete the work in 52 days. I don't know. But what I do know, for them to go into a work like this and to accomplish it as quickly as they did, he had to be a prayerful man, but he had to also recognize they're wrong. He had to recognize the reality of it. And what does he do? He goes before God and he's begging God their forgiveness. We, we've said it from this pulpit over and over. You've heard it all your lives. That if we're going to move forward in Christ, we must first repent of sin. We must, we must rid our life of that. We must strive to get out of that and move forward as godly people with sins forgiven. He was one who said, you know what? There's sin here. We need forgiveness of this and we need to do what God would have us to do. If you continue on in chapter 1 verses 8 through 11, he was a godly leader. A great quality of this man being a godly leader was that he knew the word of God. Notice beginning in verse 8. But if you return to me, he's praying this prayer about the people who had sinned. And he said in verse uh, 7, which you commanded your servant Moses, from verse 8, remember I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of heaven, Yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And then leading into chapter 2, he mentions that he's the king's cupbearer but he knows the word of God if you see in verse 8 remember the word that you commanded 
we talked about this again a little bit last Sunday morning with the prayer of Moses in the book of Exodus. It's not that God has forgotten any of this stuff or really that he needs us to remind us. But we see the, the, the prayer of faithful children of God as they approach him. And the discussion is about his word. Here's a man who knew the word of God. We, we can never have godly leaders without knowing God. They must know God. And they must know God it, not only just knowing his word, but having that, that deep relationship with him. That relationship with him that causes them to, to live godly lives day in and day out. This was a man who knew the word of God, and that's why he could pray the way he prayed. That's why he could uh, become the great leader that he became in this book. Notice in chapter 2, chapter 2, and by the way, we're not going through every verse of every chapter of this book. It just so happens a lot of the qualities we see uh, in the first couple of chapters. He was a leader who was willing to forget himself. This goes back to he had compassion for the people. He was concerned for the people. He was concerned for their welfare. So you see as chapter 2 begins, he's in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. The wine was before him. I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had never before, now I had never been sad in his presence before. You see, that, that goes into a little more of a compassion for the, for the news. <clears throat> When members of the church suffer, does it make us sad? Does it hurt us? Or do we just move on as if nothing has happened to our family? This man was deeply troubled because of his people and his home. In verse 2, therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. And I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire? The king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. There's the prayerful man again. I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to my city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me. Here was a man, a leader, that we see in the first eight verses of chapter 2. He was willing to forget himself. He was willing to forget his position. He was willing to forget what was going on uh, in, in, in his place with the king, King Artaxerxes, to go back. And, and, and what we know as you continue to read the book was at times dangerous situations. And he even understood the danger because he asked, will you send letters with me? Protection. Protection. Will you send letters in verse 7 for protection? Will you send letters in verse 8 so, so we can rebuild, so we can do the work that we need to do? How many times in the Bible were godly people before kings? God will, will, will take his people and put them in positions to change the course of nations. Moses, Daniel, Nehemiah, Paul, and no doubt it has happened over and over in the Christian period of time where God will take godly people and set them before great leaders, kings and queens and others to help them set the course of nations. And we see here's Nehemiah in this position at this time where the king has the authority to give him letters for his protection, to give him letters for the, the timber. So we see he's a man who forgot himself. He's willing to Leave all of this to go to... Imagine what he's undertaking as you read the next few chapters until you get to chapter 6 and verse 15 with the rebuilding of this wall. But he was willing to forget himself for his people and for his home city. He, we see in verse 7 that he's a man who wanted peace. That's a quality of a leader. He wanted peace. Now you're going to see later, we're going to talk about it in a moment, 
that when there was a need to protect themselves, they did. They did. That, that, that's a quality of a leader. But he wanted peace. He asked for peace. If you continue in chapter 2 and you get down to verse 13, you see that he was a leader who was willing to survey the situation. He was wise enough to survey the situation. Chapter 2, you see in verse 11, he was in Jerusalem three days. What does he do in verse 12? He goes out at night. And then in verse 13, I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and to the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. We see two areas of his leadership here in these three verses, 11, 12, and 13. He was willing to go out by night. I think that says a little more about the peace that we talked about in verse 7. You know, I, I do believe this is lending way to not allowing others to see him and what, he's, what is he doing. Not wanting the trouble brought upon them at least too soon because we know as this chapter develops, others, adversaries of them, they want to try to stop them. But we see also that he's looking at this, he's surveying the situation. He said, okay, what do we have? In chapter 1, he heard a report, but now he is there. He can lay eyes on it. And that might be the same for leaders in the Lord's church today. They hear a report, uh, whether it's good or bad, Maybe it's a situation that they have to address. Maybe it's a work that somebody's wanting to support, wanting them to support. Whatever it might be, they say, okay, we've heard about it, but let's survey the situation. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's find out a little more. Let's see exactly what's going on here before we make a decision. That is a quality leader. In verse 17 of this same chapter, he was a leader who appealed for helpers. Verse 17, Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may longer be a reproach. He couldn't do this by himself. And no one person can carry on the work of the church by himself. Great leaders will look out and say, What can you do to help? Or, or even say, This is where we need help. This is what we need. We, we need this in the church. And, and they'll be willing to delegate. They'll be willing to say, okay, you can do this, do it. I suppose that's sometimes the most difficult quality to, to, to develop in leaders is the willingness to let others take a job and run with it. That, that can be a struggle if, if you're one who's maybe a, a natural leader. It can sometimes be difficult. To let others take on a work. Here was a man who said, let's do this together. Let's do this together. Let's work on this together. His leadership was still there, but he was allowing the other people to work. He was concerned about the image of God's people. You see again in verse 17, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may long, no longer be a reproach. He was concerned about the image of God's people. Godly leaders today. Well, let me back up. Godly people. Christians are concerned about the image of the Lord's church. If you are a New Testament child of God, if you have been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, that means the blood of Christ has washed away your sins. If you're not concerned about the image of the Lord's church day in and day out, may I encourage you to focus on that through prayer, study, fasting, meditation, whatever it might be, until you learn to have a godly concern for his church. We should all have this concern for the Lord's church, that we want it to have the best image it can have in this community. The leadership, just the same, has a concern for the church. That's why they're placed in the leadership position. That's why sometimes when you see it's what happened in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when reproach was being brought upon the church, the community would have known about it. The city of Corinth would have known about it. Gossip would have spread. The leaders had to step in and say, we need to straighten this up. It's given the church a bad image. Notice in chapter 2 and verse 19, he was a leader who was not, he was not stopped by opposition. As we mentioned he goes out at night in the first three verses, 11, 12, and 13 of this particular text that we're in. We're in chapter 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. He goes out by night. But notice what happens in verse 19. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, 
official and Gershom, the Arab, heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against a king? Here's your opposition. Here's what Nehemiah knew was going to happen. But he would not stop. If the Lord's church stopped every time we met opposition, we would not be meeting here. I guarantee you. If elders in the Lord's church gave up every time they met opposition, whether it's from within or without Acts chapter 20, we wouldn't be here. I guarantee you. There's opposition there. That's part of life. And even away from the church, we must not give up every time someone opposes us. We must continue on. We must push forward. That's the same true in the Lord's church. You see in chapter 4 in the first nine verses, we'll not read all of them, but once again, here comes the opposition. They're mocking them. In verse 2, uh, he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? You know, they're you see what they're doing here? They're going to build these walls in a day. I said earlier, do you think Nehemiah thought that he would ever complete this work in 52 days? I don't think his opposers thought that either. <laughs> you know, they're kind of making fun of him. We do this in a day? What did, what did they say in verse 3? Whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. That's how people work. They start out trying to stop you, and if they can't, They'll go to the next step and the next and the next until either they're successful or you're successful. You must choose to be successful. He did not stop at opposition. Notice in verses 13 through 17 of chapter 4, he did protect his people. That's a great leader. He was willing to protect his people. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall, says verse 13, at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your horses. And you continue on to see where the workers were taking shifts. Uh, to protect themselves and even holding a, a tool in one hand in verse 17 and a weapon in the other hand. He was a leader who was willing to protect his people and willing to equip his people for protection. We're not going to look at it this evening, but you might want to jot down in your notes Acts chapter 20 verses 29 through 31. That's when Paul gave charge to the elders from Ephesus that they had a responsibility to protect the flock from these, these, these wolves that would come into the Lord's church and try to destroy it. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, the elders having that responsibility to protect their flock, watching out for their souls. Notice in chapter 2 and verse 20, as well as chapter 4 and verse 20 of the book of Nehemiah, he was a leader who took God into his plans. We've already talked about how he was a leader who prayed to God, but in chapter 2 and verse 20, so I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will rise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. He put his trust in God. He put God in his plans. Acts chapter 15 is a great chapter to read for when there are divisions, disputes, maybe even arguments in the Lord's church. And you see the apostles and the elders and others coming together in Jerusalem for this Jerusalem conference, council, whatever you might want to say. But what do they do? They see what God would have them to do. They consider the matter and they come to a conclusion based upon the word of God. Nehemiah took God into his plans. Brethren and friends, we need leaders today who, when they sit down to discuss things, matters of the church, the first question with a prayerful heart is always, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Word of God say about this? Do we have authority to do this? Is this a wise decision? Should we try something else? Take God into their plans. He was a leader who would not compromise. Chapter 6, Nehemiah chapter 6. Notice verses 2 through 4. Then Sambalat, the, the Geshem, and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages of the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Here they, they're coming again. Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. They keep coming, they keep coming, they keep coming. They continue. You see, I didn't put this in here, but the long-suffering of a leader. 
Wouldn't it be nice if an eldership could sit down and say, whew, got all those problems taken care of. Never again will we have to deal with anything. That's not the case. The long-suffering of a leader. Consider that when you look at these chapters. But you continue on in chapter 6 and verse 3. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? We see that he was a man who would not compromise. He continued. He, 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 he heard about the work in chapter 1. He wept over it. He prayed about it. He, he got authority from the king to go. He went and he surveyed the situation in chapter 2. He made his plan. He, he encouraged the people to work. Let us rise up and build. Again, chapter 2 and verse 18. And once they were in the work, he did not stop. He did not compromise. He did not, he did not go away from it. He saw it through until the end. Notice that he was a leader who was humble. Look at chapter 4 and verse 6. You can also jot down in your notes chapter 2 and verse 20. But chapter 4 and verse 6 so we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Notice that. He didn't say, I built the wall. How many people in this position would love to stand before the people and say, look what I did. Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. But he said, we built the wall. He was humble. Chapter 6 and verse 16 and it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. He was humble that he really, he's not taking the praise, he's giving it to, to other people and he's giving it to God. He was a leader as we saw in chapter 4 and verse 20 as well as chapter 2 and verse 20. He was a leader who was willing to encourage his people. He kept encouraging his people that's what a, a leader who wants results, results of rising up and build, results of helping the people to have this mind of work. Let me ask you, did these people have a mind to work before Nehemiah was there? Possibly, but they probably didn't realize it. You see, they needed someone like Nehemiah to come to them. And you know what it's like. You, you've... You, you've been around leaders like this, whether it's in the church or out of the church. You've been around leaders that, that have been able to get more out of you than you ever thought was in there. And maybe you're a leader. Maybe, maybe without bragging, maybe with that humble spirit, you know that you're someone that has that ability that you can get just a little more out of someone. You think about this humble leader who continued to encourage people to work, even when the opposition was there. That's a great leader who says, you know, this, this is my work. I want to continue to encourage people. Our last thought from chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. I think what made Nehemiah such a great leader, he was one with the people. He was one with the people. He was, he was a part of them. It wasn't that here he was up here and there they are down there. He was one with them chapter 5 and verse 14 moreover from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes 12 years neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions and you continue to read down to the end of the chapter and you see where you know all that he could have had all that was there all that was available but instead he was generous with what he had sharing with the others they, they saw him as one of them. You might want to jot down 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Again, we talked about that last month. Probably going to hear that a lot on our fourth Sunday p.m. services. These shepherds in the Lord's church are to shepherd the sheep, shepherd the flock. They're to be one with the people. That's what we need in the Lord's church today. Leadership such as Nehemiah, who is one with the people. I can't really lead other people to the Lord if I'm not following the Lord myself. Robbie's going to come and lead us in our song of encouragement. And we want to ask you a simple question. Are you following the Lord? And if you cannot say that you are based on the scriptures, based on the word of God, then we want to help you to follow the Lord. If you should have a desire to begin following him this evening, we can help you to get from where you are 
to where you need to be. And we would love to help you to do that, should it be your choice. If so, please come as we stand and as we sing.